Good morning, everyone. Um, good to have you here this morning. Uh, my name is Yemi Akoda. I'm a first year master student in the Energy Graduate Group. Um, the presentation this morning is on residential education in Sacramento and its barriers. And uh, first of all, say a special thank you to Panasonic for providing the funding for this project and with support from the, national, the new Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, NEDO of Japan. And they supported this, um, this project majorly to, to know the appliances and the residential appliances in Sacramento and California and identify ways to decarbonize through residential appliance electrification. So the agenda for this morning is on the background, the scope of our research, the methodology used, and the housing stock in Sacramento, and the models and the preliminary findings, and most of our discussion will be on the key barriers that we identified, um, the key barriers to residential education. And just to also mention that um, we had a, a, team, a team of EEI contributors on this. Uh, we had Sarah, Ashley, myself, Alan Mayer, Ben, David, Teresa that will speak next and Rachel. So we had a lot of people that worked on, on this. So the methodology we reviewed, um, several studies that have been done on residential electrification, electrification generally on greenhouse gas reduction. And also we collected primary data from 13 representatives, which included um, key stakeholders from the utilities, policymakers, researchers, and other advocacy groups. And then also we had uh, several advisory committee meetings and panel discussions, and also panel discussions with all electric constructions and housing developers. So we collected data from all of these people to that helped our research and these interviews. Then we also had scenario modeling for what we think will, will be the, the, the several scenarios that could drive electrification. So the scope of our research was majorly to investigate and quantify the appliances for residential electrification, but this discussion is not on those numbers but we'll be focused mainly on the barriers to electrification that we identified. So why electrification? Um, as some of us might know, uh, California plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% um, below 1990, 1990 levels by 2050. And um, buildings currently consume about 25 buildings, meaning residential and commercial, are responsible for roughly 25% of California's greenhouse gas emissions. And there needs to be to reduce these emissions from the buildings as much as possible. And um, in, in reducing this, the appliances we use in our homes will contribute greatly to that reduction. And presently we have the SB1477 and the Assembly Bill 3232 that seek to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in buildings, but this will not be sufficient to to contribute to reduce this greenhouse gas emissions tremendously. Um, stakeholders generally believe that um, building electrification is inevitable in the long run in, in reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. But when and how this will be done, and when and how this will be done is uncertain. And the earlier we do it, the, the better for every one of us. So just the background on the city of Sacramento, um, the city has already set goals to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. And it's also presently finalizing the new building electrification ordinance, which mandates that all low rise buildings, three stories or less, will be all electric from the first day of 2023. And also buildings that are higher than three stories will be all electric from the first day of 2026. These are some of the policies that will drive um, electrification. Then um, SMOD, which is Sacramento Municipal Utility District, is the utility that provides electricity in the city of Sacramento. And it's, it's unique because it's an all electric, electric only utility, and it, it has roughly 560,000 residential customers. SMOD currently has a, has a zero carbon plan for 2030, and 50% of its electricity generation is from non carbon fuel sources. SMOD's goal is to reach 100% um, um, residential electrification by 2045. And it's presently implementing several programs 
to promote decarbonization. Um, SMOD currently records energy efficiency advancement in terms of avoided carbon, carbon dioxide emissions instead of the previously um, recorded avoided energy consumption. And this particular metric is used by is used by SMOD. And SMOD was the first utility in the United States to, to adopt this metric, which is which is a good one. And just to also mention that um, SMOD's electricity prices are quite low. When you compare the prices from SMOD to other utilities, it's about 35% lower. So um, SMOD is doing well in terms of pushing electrification. And also SMOD provides incentives uh, to reduce um, the costs associated with electrification and also try to train co contractors to promote electrification. So what's the typical house in Sacramento? What does it look like? So we have two houses in the picture and um, the house on the, on the left is a more recent home that was built um, in the more recent, maybe 2015. And um, the house on the, on the right is a, a home that was built in, in the 1970s. And as, as you can see, both homes are, and are candidates for electrification. However, all will be done in both homes are different. So for example, the house on the left, which, is, which was built more recently, met the, ten, the, the title 24, but the other home didn't meet that. So both homes actually have um, gas water heaters, they have electric panels, they have gas heating, and electric air, air conditioners, and the, the, new, the newer home has a new electric cloth dryer and gas stove. But as I said earlier, what will be done in both homes differ, and the, the barriers that will be that we encounter in trying to electrify both homes also differ greatly, and we'll see more of this as we continue in the presentation. So what are the appliances that will be replaced in these homes? As I said, we have the water heater that will be replaced by an heat pump water heater. We have the furnace that will be replaced by an heat pump heater. We have the cloth dryer that will be replaced with an, in an electric cloth dryer. Then we have the stove that will be replaced by either an electric stove or the more preferred induction stove. And the oven also can be replaced by electric oven. So for this replacement, for example, the water heater the retrofits to replace gas storage tanks heater we, with heat pump storage water heater we often require upgrades to the electric branch circuits and in older buildings some of these may require upgrades in the service panel so the, so when you need to change the service panel for example due to the fact that um, the the initial the panel you have might be just 120 volts and needs to increase to maybe 208 volts or 240 volts that kind of service panel upgrade will it could cost could cost much. Then also um, just to explain how the heat pumps work during the heating season, the air source heat pumps move move um, work move moving moves the energy from the air outside at lower temperature outside into the house to keep it at a higher temperature. They can op operate operate either in the air conditioning or eating mode by changing the direction of refrigerant flow, flow in the circuit using a re reverse valve. So the technology for the heat pump just can work both when the, um, the temperature is high outside or even when it is low. Um, so this is just a um, graph showing the, the mix of energy of, um, of the appliances. As, as you can see for water heaters in Sacramento, um, for water heaters in Sacramento, 80% of the homes use um, gas for, for water heating, for space heating, uh, it's 7% of the homes use um, gas. And for stove, um, for cooking, 60% of the homes use um, gas. And however, for, for cloth dryers, we have quite a high number using electric. Uh, these figures we're gotten from the US Census Bureau. So um, for this, for this, for what we did, we used um, SMOD as a case study, as I mentioned. And as I said, SMOD, SMOD has um, 560,000 residential customers and about 75% of them are single family homes. So we use an S-curve adoption model, um, which estimated the market demand. And some of the parameters we used in the model were 
were, were the number of existing homes and the estimated number of new constructions over the next um, 30 years. And then we use the expected life range of the appliances, the natural replacement rates, the current prevalence of the appliances, the initial and the ultimate adoption rates based on the, um, the RAS data and the data that were available to us from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. And we're also from the American Housing Survey. And preliminary research just shows that there is a large market for the electric appliances, but um, policies and incentives will, will drive this electrification. So aside the model, we also tried to do a few scenarios. And one of the, uh, we did four major scenarios. And one is, is to maintain status quo for SMART to just um, continue with its low incentives from now until when people will face out the existing equipment appliances. And that will that showed us that we could um, we'll continue, if they continue at this space, we could um, electrician will reach 100% in about maybe in 2040. Then the second is to push initiatives, incentives out so much, so much right now. And this could lead to maybe 60% um, electrification by, by 2035. And this will just slow down and all that. Then also there's also another one for small to quickly roll out, roll out uh, its incentives. Then maybe a policy mandated electrification in 2030 will also just continue the electrification. Then the last one is, oh, is that um, early retirement mandate, which requires that SMART should continue its program quickly in providing incentives for, for homes. And that um, 50, but it is raised about 50% in 2030 and a policy mandating that homes should retire their gas equipment will, will just um, continue the electrification. So in all of this, it shows that um, policies and incentives will drive electrification, but what exactly will happen, we, we don't know. And that's what we found out. So just looking at this and the, looking at this map, as I said earlier, the policy landscape is uneven, it's uncertain and rapidly changing. As you can see, we have, we have a few cities and local jurisdictions that have mandated gas bans in, in California, and most of them are in, in, in Northern, Northern California. So SMOD is particularly in a better position compared to other utilities because it's an all electric, it's an electric only util, utility. And all that is customers just need to do is to just maybe stop um, accepting um, gas into their homes and they, they could reduce, um, reduce um, utility bills. So as you can see, most of these um, places that have adopted um, gas bans and rich codes are in Northern California, and they are all in the same vicinity. So there's, there's just this closeness around them. And we, we think other parts of California should also adopt similar, similar gas ban and rich codes. So why is Sacramento and its mode particularly unique is that first of all, SMOD has the potential of increasing its revenue through electrification because it's an all electric, um, electric only utility. So it doesn't, it's not moving its revenue from maybe one other product to electricity, or this is all it does. And um, currently it has a lower electric rate, which is about 35% compared to other utilities. And um, from the estimates available to, to Ross, there, will not, there won't be an increased utility bill for small customers when they electrify because they will simply be moving the money they pay on gas to electric. And also the city of Sacramento also plans to, to, re, to electrify 25% of the total floor area of existing buildings over the next 10 years. So this just tells that there's an alignment between the, the, city of, the, the plans of the city of Sacramento and small plans, which makes it easy for electrician to thrive in, in, um, in Sacramento. So the main discussion today will be on the barriers. What are the barriers to electrification? So as I said earlier, the very first is the policy uncertainty. There is just an uncertainty in the states and 
in the, in the state of California on, on, on home electrification. And this is a major barrier to electrification. As I showed in the previous slide, the local and uh, some local and a few a few local 42 in part 42 um, local jurisdictions have tried to electrify, but timing is very essential, and the 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 timing will 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 make us know how how far or how quick this will go. The second is the is product design. So each pump technology can be difficult to integrate into the existing home infrastructure. And there needs to be a special retrofit design and other adoptions needed for, for this product to fit in. And also, particularly, there is, there is a space constraint and wiring constraint for, for this product to fit in into the very old homes. You can imagine if you have to change the, the, um, the space eating and water eating equipment for a home that was built in 1950 compared to that, that was built in 20, 2010. So there's the, there's the product design barrier. Then the next is the system capacity. So new electric panels will be required to accommodate an increase in the electric consumption in some homes, depending on the market. So for some homes, there needs to be a panel upgrade. As I, as I said, the most of the homes use a 120 volt and the heat pump often is at 204, 240 volts. So there needs to be a panel upgrade, which can, be which can be expensive for for some people then skills shortage so um there's a report from sierra club and i'll quote it it says it is currently difficult to find contractors and hvac professionals familiar with electrification so there's this there's a, there's a shortage in skills of tradespeople that support electrification and in some cases some of those that can't um that can't provide this um this support to those that are that want to electrify often tell them to maybe often tell try to convince them to just um keep their gas equipment or change to a gas equipment and in some cases they even try to um inflate the costs that is associated with um, um changing out the gas appliances so this is also a major constraint. And the next is the coordination among trades. So for you to change out um, um, a gas appliance, like the water heater, you need a, a plumber, an electrical engineer, and you also need a mechanical engineer. So there needs to be a coordination among these trades. So if, so we need a, a you need a, a contractor that can actually work, that can do the work of a plumber, electrical engineer, and a mechanical engineer. And if you have to bring in three people to do this work, it will be more expensive. It will be more expensive, and it will also be, it also consume more time. So there needs to be a coordination among the trades to see how this can be addressed. The next barrier is the consumer attitude. So and needs. So across California, there is um, the the weather is different. So and the culture is a bit different as well so the, the needs of different people the, there's a different need across california and so this also is a barrier to electrification then also there there's um there's an attitude at times some people feel the the gas cooker cooks better than an induction stove or because the induction stove is um requires a, a special type of um kitchenware so these are some of the attitudes that people have towards electrification and some of this perception needs to be to be changed. The next is affordability, and which is also tied to, to equity. The upfront cost of education can be a bit high in terms of the equipment, the panel, and the labor costs. And ensuring av av um, affordability and equity will be a challenge through costs. And, um, and we think this will reduce as the, the market matures. However, one of the things that SMOD particularly has done is to provide incentives that reduces these costs on people to to electrify. And we also think when people change out their gas um, appliances, um, the utilities bill will generally um, decrease. And the final barrier is the distribution network capacity. So if a particular city or a particular neighborhood decides to, to, um, to electrify, there might be there will be an increase in the load cap, load capacity and 
we we are unsure whether the the transformer in that particular place can actually accommodate the load so the distribution network needs to be to be checked checked and uh, also grid reliability which is another topic on its on its own so all of these are barriers that that could um, limit um electric residential education in in sacramento and even um california thank you i don't know if you have questions great thank you yami and um, there is one question that came in um Super G was wondering, what is the difference in the clothes dryer replacement and is it more efficient? So clothes dryers, most, so for clothes dryers, um, it is more efficient to use the electric dryers compared to the gas dryers. As I mentioned, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. That's the, that's the major goal here. So the electric clothes dryers are more efficient compared to the gas clothes dryers at least for my research. I can't hear you, Ali. Great, yeah, if there's any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and um, we can get those asked. Yemi, is this work continuing or is this kind of the end of the project or kind of what's the status of that? So we've done, we, so we've, the, the project is done already, but um, the results are yet to be published. So we have the numbers already of the estimated um, outcomes of the market numbers and quantity of, um, quantity of appliances to be replaced in Sacramento. Great. Well, I'll put your, if you're okay, I'll put your email in the chat here so if people can follow up if, um, if any additional questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Yemi. And then we'll turn it over to Teresa and Robbie. Okay, hello. Hello again, Hi. Teresa. You are you are recurring Energy Bite speaker. Always good to have you. Hmm. Yes, so um I'm sorry, I was, I'm not prepared. Um, That's okay, we're a couple minutes ahead of schedule. One second. Um, that's why. I had it open, but I guess they closed it. I had it up if you want, Teresa. No, it's okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. I'm just, I was searching the box instead of the share. It's coming. Okay, so today I'm going to present on um, some work we did at WCEC with regard to testing um, a HVAC air trap made by Deschamps Technologies. And I uh, just want to recognize the project team, which also includes Rachel Collins, um, Robbie, who's going to also present today, and uh, undergraduate student uh, Taylor. Um, <clears throat> So uh, introduction, um, a P-trap is generally um, a PVC or copper drain that you'll see installed on the, um, under the evaporator coil of the air conditioner. And so what this does is when you are moving um, warm air over a cold coil, um, as the air cools, uh, if the air also, the air also has humidity in it, and if the temperature drops, if the air drops below the dew point, you produce water, you produce condensate. And so that condensate drips off the coil and collects in the drain pan and then drains from the unit out of a, out of a pipe, like a copper or PVC pipe. Um, a, the traditional design um, is to have what's called a P trap here, where the water comes out of the unit and then there's a rise back up in the pipe and water builds up um, in this pipe. And that's to prevent air from leaking out um, of the pipe when there's no condensate uh, being made. So like the condensate will, will uh, accrue in this pipe and then we'll stay there blocking the air leakage over time. Um, one of the issues is that there's a significant pressure inside this air handler box 
And so you actually need like several inches of water column of water to prevent that water from just being blown out or sucked into the unit, uh, depending on the orientation of the fan. And oftentimes these traps are not installed um, to meet those design requirements. They're either, the, in actuality, no poo trap gets installed at all, or it's too short. Um, and even a well-designed and installed pea trap could run into issues because in California, the air is very dry um, in the winter and shoulder seasons. And so, and oftentimes there's no cooling. So the water is not being generated and over time the, the water will just evaporate out of the trap. Um, and then as soon as the, the pressure in the air handler is greater than the water pressure in the trap, all the water will be um, blown out of the trap. So um, if the trap is dry, this basically becomes a significant leak inside your air handler. And so you lose um, heated and cooled air to the outdoors, wasting energy. So this is a um, new technology um, that we tested called the HVAC air trap. Um, it's been commercialized for several years. Um, it eliminates air leakage from the condensate pipe and it reduces the space required for the trap. So basically the way that it works is, um, so for example, here's a, a version where um, there is a, this is positively, well, sorry, let's look up here at the first one. So in this orientation, the air handler is at a negative pressure and it's drawing air in through the condensate pipe. So this little lightweight ball here moves and blocks that leak. Um, and then when there's water draining, it just, drains out, moves the ball, and uh, drains the water out. So in this, with this product, there's no standing water in the pipe. Um, and there's different designs for the trap based on, um, there's different models of this product based on the expected pressure in the air handler and also whether the air handler is positively or negatively pressurized, which can change just depending on the design of the unit. Um, and where the condensate, where the evaporator is relative to the fan in the system. So we designed um, some laboratory testing to test these products. Um, we measure the air leakage in a dry PVC pipe. We did different pipe lengths. Um, we did different pipe diameters. We tested at different pressures. Um, and uh, we also built a, a P trap as well. And all of most of the laboratory testing was designed to um, compare against the model, which I'm going to tell you about um, in a couple in the next slide. Um, we also tested uh, several models of the uh, Deschamps air trap. And so you can see them all here in the picture. Um, the P series are designed for positive pressure air handlers. The N series are designed for negative pressure air handlers and the FCN and the RLC um, work in both directions. And so you can see here, we, these are all the different um, uh, sizes that we tested and the different uh, pressures that we tested at. Um, so all in all, you can see here, we tested uh, 10 different traps. We also built an analytical model to um, validate our, our open pipe tests against, um, sorry, we use the model basically to validate the lab test. So the benefit here is that we obviously can only lab test a certain number of configurations. And once we've used that to validate the model, we can look at other potential scenarios. Um, so basically here, we just have a schematic of a um, air moving through a dry condensate pipe. Um, and we want to calculate the leakage, which is basically a function of the resistance in the pipe um, and the entrance and exit effects. Um, and so we basically, we use um, Bernoulli's equation. We neglect any, in Bernoulli's equation, the, the height difference also matters, um, but uh, with air, the, the pressure difference uh, relative to a couple inches of, um, of elevation for air are uh, negligible. So we neglect that. Um, and we basically calculate a equation for the velocity of the air in the pipe relative to the pressure difference. 
That's the external static pressure, the length of the pipe, the diameter of the pipe, the density of the air, um, and these two coefficients, which I'll describe further. So um, the variable K is basically a, a loss coefficient related to um, whether or not the pipe has, for example, any elbows. Um, so in a P-trap, we have, you have four elbows um, and also the entrance and exit effects. So the air coming into the pipe and the air exiting the pipe. And so we use existing correlations from literature to estimate the loss from the elbows, the loss from the inlet and the loss from the outlet. And so you can see here, for example, the straight pipe, we estimate the losses at 1.42. And for the pipe with the elbows, we estimate the losses at 2.72. Teresa, real quick, I, I see a, I don't know if anyone else sees it, but there's like a black box that's oh, constantly sorry, that's on your good. slide. Yeah. OK, got it. Perfect. Um, finally, we have to calculate, this is a friction coefficient, of the, which is related to the pipe surface. Um, and so we, we tested PVC pipe and we assume a roughness from literature for that. Um, and then from that, and uh, basically the, the issue here is this is an iterative, iterative calculation because the velocity of the air moving through the pipe affects the Reynolds number and the friction factor. And then the friction factor changes the answer of the velocity in the pipe. So you have to iterate this, the solution. Um, so we basically make an initial guess for F and then uh, iterate the calculation. And we do this, uh, we calculate the analytical results for, for, every, um, for every scenario that we lab tested. I'm going to hand it over to Robbie, who's going to explain how the lab testing was done. And the end, we'll show you the comparison between the laboratory test results and the analytical model. All right, this kind of lays out what we made and um, sort of the details on what we did to make it. So the first thing we did was construct a wooden test chamber um, big enough to handle, that black box is in the middle here, yeah. um, big enough to handle the P-traps in both the positive and negative orientations for how they were built and to also accommodate the one and two foot pipes for a negative test as well. The longer pipes we only did in a, positive um, leak orientation. Um, we designed a nozzle box basically with three nozzles according to a standard to accurately measure airflow. And that standard is outlined in AHRI standard 37, 2009. Um, the three different nozzles allow us to like open and close them in different orientations to cover a range from four to 87 um, cubic feet per minute. And then we place a bunch of sensors to accurately measure like the air properties. So we know the density um, and that's needed for calculating the Reynolds number and everything like Teresa was saying, to know the exact flow of air going through it. Um, as a note, this range is for like a high accuracy measurement. You can still measure outside of this range, but it's air goes up significantly. Um, so this is a diagram of the um, apparatus we made. So there's a blower inlet on the far right here with the arrow. And that comes into kind of a box that we ended up putting uh, pressure relief valves on top of. I don't know if Teresa or someone can circle those little valves in the back of the picture. Um, and then the rest of these pieces are parts of that uh, AHRI standard. There's, two, there's a diffusion baffle. And then a point where we measure temperature, relative humidity of the air inside, and then a differential and a static pressure across this nozzle plate. So we know the pressure upstream of that nozzle plate, and then a differential pressure across the nozzle plate, which are both needed for calculating the density and the flow through that nozzle plate. Um, there's another diffusion baffle after the nozzle box, which just has to be a certain distance away. And then we added an access door so that we could change which nozzle configurations are open and closed to measure accurately certain ranges of flow. There's also a barometric pressure outside and a static pressure for this chamber so we can measure at specific uh, pressures for each of the nozzle um, 
each of the pipe lengths and the various P-traps to cover our grid. Um, there's also a detail here of the nozzles. You can see the three different sizes. B and C in this um, configuration are closed and there's a little nozzle up in the upper left, nozzle A for the lowest flows measured. Um, okay, so this is uh, details on all of the pipe lengths and pressures that we measured for the test to validate the model. We did the four different pressures for each pipe length and four different pipe lengths for each size of pipe that covers a grid. I don't know, what is that? Four times uh, 64 different tests, I guess, something like that. And uh, it also includes the positive and negative pressure tests for the two and one foot lengths. So that adds, adds another um, 32 tests, I believe. And there's details on all those. Uh, I don't know if there's anything specific. If Teresa wants to add something here, she can. Well, I think well, the, I main, think the main, main um, echoing. The main takeaway is that um, just keep an eye on the the magnitude of these leaks uh, when there's an open pipe. So, depend on a on a three quarter inch diameter pipe, we're talking about you know twenty cfm. On an inch and a half diameter pipe, we're talking anywhere up to like seventy cfm. So those are pretty pretty significant leaks um, in an air handler. Right, of course. Um, this is details on the analytical model outputs that Teresa went over versus what we actually measured in the lab for all the various sizes. And then a uh, linear fit to show like how closely we matched the model. Um, I would say there's quite good agreement here. Um, I agree. <laughs> pretty much it. Um, this is a uh, results for the actual um, air traps that we tested. So you see the P and N series and then the RLC and FCN series in the positive and negative arrangements for those two. And then there's four different sizes for the P and N series models. Uh, and again, look at the magnitudes. These are all below one CFM, which like I said at the beginning is outside of our range of ac highly accurate measurements, but is well below the measurements for anything else and shows significant improvement in the leak. Uh, and it's a, the error, I would say everything would definitely be below one CFM, even if you had measured it very accurately. Um, I don't know, one thing I find interesting myself is the N series and the RLC series but in because of their arrangement, I feel like the ball weight until you have enough pressure seems to leak a little bit more. So it like seats the ball in, but that's all I have to say there. Um, so basically at the, at the end of all this, um, we conclude that the, the HVAC air trap technology is, is really an excellent alternative to a few trap um, that will reduce air leakage um, to in a condensate drain line to a negligible amount such that you don't have to be concerned with when and how much condensate is being produced. And it really uh, simplifies the condensate drain line design um, and installation. Is there leakage amounts on the P-trap we measured? Yeah. Um, we only did it with the one inch diameter pipe, but it was oh, okay, okay. Yeah, there it is. 20, 20 CFM. Um, but we can really model, you know, any any scenario. Um, but the main the main takeaway is is that if you can install the air trap and get below one CFM in basically any case, then um, uh, everything becomes very very simple. Like ninety five percent reduction in the leak or better. Questions? That's our there last are, slide. That's great. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'm not, if you can see them or I can read them, whatever is easiest. Um, oh, Jim I'm had a question and then Chris. Um, I don't see Chris's, but I see Jim. Okay. Um, typical ashtray reporting is a percentage of flow at a given static pressure. 
Um, so in this particular case, we don't have an entire air handler. We're only creating the pressure just to generate the leak through the pipe um, so that we can accurately measure it, um, which is very difficult. It's very difficult to measure a, a couple of CFM or 10 CFM um, like on a field unit. So that's why we developed this lab scenario. But now what we're going to do um, is we're actually going to do some energy modeling uh, now that we have these results where we'll, we'll basically look at um, like what condensate drain lines are used on typical systems so we can compare the, uh, the leak through a dry condensate line to the actual air handler flow and we're going to be coming up with some energy uh, impact estimates for this technology. And so, so we're working on that currently. Great. The question from Chris um, is, uh, what is the price comparison between a standard P-trap and the HVAC air trap? Is the HVAC air trap readily available to the general public? Um, it's readily available. Um, Chris, I was actually meaning to reach out to you about this, um, but maybe we could get a conversation uh, together with the manufacturer, but they are um, widely commercially available. Um, I'm not, the pricing depends on the system, so don't don't hold me to it, but I want to say they're like in the twenty to thirty dollar range, depending on the model. Um, so, uh, but you know, if you if you don't have to have a bunch of elbows, um, you know, maybe it's uh, uh, and you save some time on installation, it could be you know cost neutral. Great. I guess that's a follow up question I had was just, is it an easy swap out or is it, is it complicated? Like, is it easy just, you just twist off the section and add this or is it? Um, well, the easiest thing is just, if you're putting in new condensate drain lines, it's just to use this instead, because then you don't have to build the P trap. So you have some time savings in like gluing that whole thing together and, and installing it. Um, if you do want to replace like, um, existing traps it's like you cut into the pvc and glue the thing on is okay what works it's as easy maybe easier than building a normal p-trap excellent any other questions uh, oh wait uh, what is the ball float made of jim had a follow-up question um there is plastic like it reminds me of like a ping pong ball Okay. Any uh, other questions? We, any hands raised? I don't see any. I'll put the um, Teresa and Robbie's email here in the chat. So if you have any additional questions you want to follow up with. Great. And uh, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel early next week. So if you wanted to, to watch, if you missed anything, feel free to follow up there as well. And with that, I guess we will end Energy Bites a little early. Have a great uh, weekend and the rest of your Friday. And we hope to see you next week. Take care, everybody. And thanks to our presenters. Really appreciate right. it. Thank you.